Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce you Nicola. Nick is my co-worker from Red Hat. But most importantly, he's one of the Python core devs. And he's especially interested in making the core devs review process very simple, above all. So give him a big applause. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so what I'm here to talk about today is open source sustainability. Like how do we keep doing this for as long as we can without burning people out? And what I'm going to start is with this. Your time is valuable. And if you take nothing else away from this talk today, it's remember this, that life is filled with people who won't respect your time. Uh, and the internet empowers us to find people who will. Um, so your time is valuable. And so is that of everyone else. So I'm betting there's some folks in this room that when I put that first slide up, said, sure, I know that. I know my time is valuable. Um, this slide's for you. Because when we're stressed, when we're busy, it's really easy for us to forget that other people are also busy and stressed. Um, this slide's for me. Um, because arrogance is something that comes very, very easily to me. Uh, and this reminds me that, hey, pay attention to the needs of other people. Respect their time. Worry about what they need and their interests, not just what I want. Um, because when we disrupt, uh, yeah, that is really important that we respect not only our time, but that of other people. And so what we get out of this is the idea that sustainability matters. The generosity of spirit in the open source community is absolutely phenomenal. Um, however, that's not a good thing if it's coming at the expense of people's health, their personal relationships, or their work commitments. So we need to care about how their factors are sustaining themselves, uh, and in many cases, the folks that depend on them. So we need sustainable open source development to be the norm in our industry, not the exception. And a lament I hear a lot is nobody pays for open source software. Then I look at where I work, and I look at what I do for a living, and I say, well, that's clearly not true. There are people out there who do pay for open source software. And so I revise that whenever I hear it. And what I hear is, nobody I care about pays for open source software. And that's a very different statement. And speaking from a personal point of view, other than games, I actually have a really hard time bringing myself to pay for open source for software that I find useful. Uh, and there's, for pretty much most of the things I want to do myself, there's going to be a free option that's good enough. Um, but that doesn't get anybody paid. That doesn't make the stuff I'm using sustainable. Um, the folks that I most care about helping, uh, which scientists and educators, they often don't have any budget to pay for software. Uh, if they do have money, there's often better things to be spending it on than software. Um, and so a lot of the folks I work with in the open source community seem to be the same way. The folks we want to help and empower have more important things to be spending money on. Like, we don't want them to be paying us, we want to be helping them. And so that means if we care about sustainable open source software, we have to get more creative in the ways that we fund it. Uh, the user pays models aren't, aren't going to work if the people that we want to help don't actually have the money in the first place. And so this is where it becomes really, really important to remember. Software is a means, not an end. Like, we can really easily lose sight of as technologists that technology ultimately doesn't matter. What matters is people and the way we can bring technology to bear to better address their needs and to allow more people the opportunity to achieve their goals and ambitions. However, in a network world, in a world that runs on computers and networks and interconnections, software is an essential facilitator and enabler in making those connections between people. And that software needs people to work on it to keep, run keep it running and keep improving it. 
And so, Tim O'Reilly has this wonderful saying about doing business in a network world, where it says, create more value than you capture. This is really, really good advice. But every time I hear it, I always mentally follow it up with, capture enough value to thrive. So not just enough value to survive, enough to thrive. So educated scientists, public service, nonprofits are often poorly served by commercial software vendors because folks that are scrapped cash, not necessarily the best market to try and sell to. Uh, but open source means we can help these companies, uh, help these communities, help themselves. However, we're still human. We need to eat. We need somewhere to live. Uh, and we want to avoid being permanently beholden to whoever happens to be our current employer. So we do the job, and then we get paid. <coughs> but wanting to get paid is all well and good. But copying a piece of software basically doesn't cost anything. It's like once you've already got the computer, once you've already got the network connection, making another copy of a piece of software has a marginal cost of zero. And one of the fundamental aspects of business is that you want to charge for the scarce resources. Um, and abundant resources that are freely duplicated, uh, freely copied, really hard to charge for. Uh, so in a lot of parts of our industry, a lot of time and a lot of money is wasted on coercively enforcing uh, artificial scarcity. You use the government to make people pay you for things that can actually be copied freely. Um, a model that actually does work really well uh, is you bundle the software with the hardware. You charge people for the hardware. Um, and that works. Uh, but it poses very high barriers to entry. It's like building a factory, investing in hardware design, all that sort of stuff. Most people can't afford to do that. And so we need a different answer. Uh, one that doesn't require those huge upfront investments uh, in getting into the hardware side of things. So we kind of need to take a step back, get into business development 101, figure out something that has a lot of expansive future demand and a naturally limited supply. And so software business models were actually originally built on paying for upgrades. You get the existing version for free, but if you wanted the new version, you had to pay for it. This actually made sense because upgrades used to involve printing and shipping physical media. You have to make new golden masters, you have to duplicate the floppy disks, you have to duplicate the uh, DVDs, you send those out. And so the business model matched what people actually had to do. Like upgrade, shipping an upgrade was expensive, so people, it made sense for people to have to pay for them. Um, the internet broke all that. Because on the internet, shipping a new version is really pretty cheap because everybody's already paying for their network connection, everybody always has their computers. The cost of publishing and downloading a new upgrade doesn't really exist. And so the idea of pay for upgrades just kind of went away. It's like people really, really get annoyed if you ask them to pay for upgrades in the modern software era. And so we need to look differently like, people do understand hardware more intuitively than they do software because hardware you can pick up, you can see what goes wrong with it, and you understand that if I want a new device, I'm going to have to pay for that. Um, but, yeah, it's, the internet broke our hardware software analogies, and so we need to find new ones if we're going to make self, open source software sustainable long term. And so, there's a different aspect of hardware maintenance that potentially also applies to software. And the thing with hardware is that you can not only charge for new devices, you can charge for maintenance on existing ones. So people, like, they not only buy new cars, they'll take their existing car into the mechanic, get the brakes checked, get the oil changed, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so hard, and if the car actually breaks again, they'll get it to the mechanic, say, Please tell me what, what's wrong with it. Please fix it for me. Uh, and so hardware maintenance is both reactive and preventative, and you can charge for both of them. Um, and so this is the thing where we intuitively understand that hardware decays if we leave it unmaintained uh, and, and don't 
continually getting its service and so on and so forth. What's significantly less obvious is that the same thing happens to software. That software left unmodified and unmaintained will actually decay over time. This is really unintuitive. It's, it's like it's software, it's bits, it can't let decay. The whole point of digital data is that we can replicate it perfectly. So what chain, what decays isn't so much the software itself as the assumptions that went into making it. Hardware changes, operating systems change, regulations change, techniques for development change, social norms in the world around us change, user expectations of the software they use change. So a piece of software that was state-of-the-art five or ten years ago is archaic now because all of these things have changed. So the world doesn't stand still, and we have to run to keep up. So that's where we find a potential opportunity. Once we've deployed a piece of software to serve a particular purpose, we really, really, really want that software to keep working for that purpose, despite of all these changes happening around it. So when the question we're asking is, will this work today? Free, so free as in here, the software works fine. It's, it's like, Getting something up and running today that works today, you can do really quite cheaply. Where things get interesting is when you start asking questions like, will this still work tomorrow? Will it work next week? Will it work next year? Will it work next decade? Folks that have the luxury of asking these kinds of questions are generally willing to pay for good answers. And so, that gives us our opportunity. It's like, is there a way we can get people to pay for keeping these critical systems right that lets us fund all of the other stuff we want to do for free? And so yeah, this basically brings us to this chart, which is an essential chart that pretty much any marketing course and business development course will cover. Um, and what it has to do is with the way technology gets adopted. So most of us in the open source world, we're in this blue section of the chart over towards me. Like, we're interested in technology for its own sake. We want to play around with it, we want to try it out, we're always looking for new things. And quite often we're the ones creating those new things ourselves. Um, and so when you're in this mode of technology for its own sake, you know, we're often very, very tolerant of shortcomings in our software because it gives something we want and we can hack around with it and get it, get it to meet our needs. So, the problem is though, is that most people aren't like that. Like, they don't want to have to fiddle around with things to get them to work and meet their purposes. What they want is they want something that just works. So this is a pattern that recurs over and over in industry after industry, for innovation after innovation, where innovators, play around with things, try things out. Early adopters say, hey, that's actually a really good idea. Let's try and popularize that. Let's see if there's a market for this. Let's see if we can get this more broadly adopted. And so that's then how you get into the section where you make your money, which is that green part of the technology adoption curve. All of the people who don't care about the technology, they care about their own problems. <laughs> and they just want a solution that works. And we see this in the open source world as well, with popularity of things like Apple hardware and that sort of stuff, where people don't actually want to work on their computer. They want to use their computer to build something else. So they want to buy something that just works, that lets them work on the things they're actually interested in. So an opportunity is all well and good, but how do you build a business on it? Like, you can't build a business unless you figure out who's going to pay you and why. Um, so that means you're trying to find a supply constraint. You want an essential capability that you can deliver better than anyone else. And so here's the interesting thing. So thanks to open source, new software is now cheap. Thanks to the public cloud, deploying a new application is now easy with, very, with next to no upfront costs. But the interesting statistic is that, according to surveys, um, there's apparently less than 30 million professional uh, developers worldwide. 
So, so that's a uh, IEC software developer server. That means people who know how to program, we're not the 1%, we're the 0.05%. A tiny fraction of the world's population can actually create new software and maintain existing software. And so this means that sustained engineering is naturally expensive because the time to do it is a very, very limited resource. And the only way to make it cheaper is to train more programs. So this brings us back to that point on the first slide. Your time is value. So we have a potential opportunity to stay in engineering on software. We have a natural scarcity, scarcity of people's time. So one of the approaches people currently take to solving that sustaining engineering problem for their businesses, for their company, for their non-profit organizations, for their governments. Magic Internet Pixies. This is a very, very popular option. Um, so open source software is often deployed with no sustaining engineering plan at all. And I call this the Magic Internet Pixies model. Um, and essentially, it assumes that the Pixies on the internet will handle changes in technology and regulation that they will make things keep working as the world changes around them. So new feature development? This is actually not a bad assumption because new feature development is actually a lot of fun. Lots of folks will do it for free. It's like, we don't have to try that hard to get people interested in developing new features for Python. And any other open source project you can make. Bang, bang. However, what's a lot harder is getting people interested in sustaining engineering. Like, fixing those weird corner cases that come up when piece of hardware A over here encounters piece of software B over there and they don't talk to each other. And you're like going, oh, well, why doesn't that work? Unless you're the person who actually has the problem, you're not going to be interested in solving it for free. But you might be interested if someone's paying you. So, so yeah, so relying on magic internet pixies for stuff you actually care about keeping working Probably not the best idea in the world, but as situations like the uh, shell shock uh, and ghost and various other bugs in very essential pieces of Linux software, um, and the core infrastructure initiative that the Linux Foundation created in response to those, um, even organizations that should know better um, can still fall into this trap on assuming the magic internet pixies are going to solve their problems. So the next step up from Magic Internet Pixies is actually paying people to support your own stuff, um, or support the projects you're using. And this is a major step up because we're saying, hey look, we depend on this software, it's important to us, we need to invest in its future. Um, and in these cases, uh, companies that are using open source projects basically get their staff to spend work time directly on contributing to the upstream projects that they depend on. Um, and that includes taking those projects that they depend on, looking for the existing contributors, and actually hiring them to come work for them. So this actually works really well. Um, but there's, very, there's a thing that people often fall into the trap of doing, where they'll employ people who work on these projects, but they won't actually let them really spend work time on that. And so that's still magic internet pixies, because you're relying on those folks having, spending their time on it outside work. Uh, now, for big enough organizations, this model can work pretty well because they're big enough, they can employ people, they can afford to dedicate the time to upstream work. Um, for small organizations, the problem is you create single points of organizational failure. If you've only got one core developer working on a particularly critical project, they decide they want to go do something else, what are you doing now? Like, core developers aren't readily replaceable because a lot of their influence is tied up in their personal relationships. Like you can't just hire a new C Python core developer and have us expect them to have us grant them commit access. Like they, everybody has to go through the same process of engaging with the community, earning the respect and contributions. Um, but one of the other things about self-support is it really constrains the number of communities you can engage with effectively. Because being closely involved with an open source community can easily be a full-time job. Uh, and for, for quite a few people, it is a full-time job. Um, and so if you're only using a small amount of open source software and you can target 
communities appropriately, self support can certainly work. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's not going to be a good option. Um, and so, this is where commercial open source redistributors come in. So, organizations that depend on open source have a need for sustained engineering. Um, they don't necessarily have the expertise or the scale to handle self support. Uh, and so, what they'll do is they'll bring on an open uh, a commercial redistributor to handle it on their behalf. Um, and essentially what redistributors are providing is they're providing community engagement as a service. Uh, so it becomes a single place to obtain software, report problems, suggest improvements, um, while still benefiting from hundreds or thousands of different open source projects. Um, and so this software then gets delivered to customers as online services or software sub subscriptions. So, so it's easy to see how this works from a business point of view, it's easy to see how it works from a customer point of view, but what does that mean for the community? Well, there's actually a really significant moral hazard here, which is that as a commercial open source redistributor, you're making money from the freely shared work of others. So if you're not careful, this can easily cross the line into unfairly exploiting the community. Um, fortunately, there are some relatively easy steps, or relatively straightforward steps, redistributors can take to help ensure they're engaging collaboratively with upstream communities uh, rather than exploiting them. Unfortunately, a lot of companies don't do this, but that's what we're working to change. So, first and foremost is the idea that as a redistributor, you have to make sure you're playing by the same rules your contributors are playing by. So, if you have rights over the software that your, your contributors don't, that's a big red flag. It's like, if an org is accepting and profiting from the work of others, but not granting that same freedom to their community members, that's a very bad sign. Um, and so, yeah, the simplest possible approach to dealing with this is to say the upstream community gets access to all of the software they help to write, um, and then use trademark law to separate your community projects from commercial ones. Um, that will still upset people, but they're still getting all the software. One of the other big things is that as a commercial vendor, you're going to have deadlines, you're going to have ship dates that you need to meet, you're going to have marketing deadlines, you're going to have things you coordinate with partners. The big thing to remember is that your deadlines are your problem. They're not the community's problem. Uh, and so one of the big things that happens here is that to meet deadlines, we're often going to have to make technical compromises. We're going to have to put the doji hack in now that we then fix in the next release, hopefully. Uh, and so, most communities aren't going to care about our deadlines uh, and are likely to get reject these kinds of compromises and they say, no, we're not going to accept it upstream until you fix it properly. Uh, and that's absolutely the right thing for them to do. For them, the project is the priority, not your commercial deadlines. Um, what this means is that to do commercial redistribution right, you really need to design in the ability to diverge from upstream temporarily. You need to make the assumption that, yes, sometimes you're going to be running ahead of upstream, you're, you're going to need a quick fix for your own purposes that you then replace with a proper fix that's acceptable to the community. And the key thing about that is that it lets you solve problems in a hurry to meet your deadlines, but then take a more leisurely approach to fixing it properly upstream and then get rid of your downstream hack. Um, the other nice thing about this approach uh, is that everything you're carrying that upstream hasn't accepted yet is basically a nice way of quantifying your technical debt uh, because if upstream is saying no to the dodgy hacks, uh, then everything you're carrying is basically a sign that, hey, there's something we need to pay down here, we need to get this into a form upstream will accept. And so, this gets us into that next point that if we're not paying anybody, they have no compensate, uh, they have no obligation to us. Uh, so, two of the essential things that I always believe should be paid for are availability and responsiveness. Now, the open source community in general, we actually have a problem with this. Uh, we'll not only allow, but we'll actively encourage folks to volunteer for things that have this kind of high time commitment to them. 
Uh, that's actually a really fast path to burn out. Uh, and it's an area where downstream re redistributors and folks running self-supported open source have a key role to play because either through direct funding or indirect funding through trade associations and foundation, we can pay for those high time commitment activities. We can make those a career opportunity for people uh, and let the volunteers focus on the stuff that's actually fun. Uh, and that basically becomes a thing of a special case of simply respecting people's time, like where I started with this. Uh, so if we're not paying them, then folks are contributing because they find it rewarding. Um, and so when folks are volunteering their own time, the needs of commercial vendors, the needs of folks using stuff in business, our business needs, quite rightly, are going to come a long way down the priority list for the volunteers. Uh, and that's exactly as it should be. Uh, so if we want something in particular, we need to be prepared to commit to providing the time and energy needed to make it happen. Um, and we also, but we also need to make sure we're willing to work collaboratively to seek communities agreement on particular courses of action before we proceed with them. So that's all very wordy and long. Um, but we've established this demand for consistent approaches to sustaining engineering across open source projects. We've established contributor times, a scarce resource we can charge for access to. And we've also identified some key mistakes that we can make that cross the line into exploiting communities rather than collaborating with them. So how do we put those pieces together? So this is how we get back to the title of this talk. Breaking the, breaking the worldview up or breaking, breaking things up into four key ways of engaging with an open source project. So, and so that's contributors, colleagues, clients, and customers. And so different folks care about different things. They have different amounts of time available. Uh, and so we want to make sure that all of those folks are able to engage in a way that works for them. So breaking those down. So contributors, contributors are there to change the world, but they're there to change the world as a whole. Uh, and so basically contributors are offered the opportunity to have an impact, but they have no specific responsibilities. Any time they're able to spare the project is a gift and it needs to be respected as such. So what projects are able to do is we have the authority to decline to accept attempted contributions. Uh, we, have, we get to define the criteria for inclusion, uh, but whether or not the payoff for getting over those barriers um, in the personal experience gain, in the impact on the project, in the wider community, whether that, that's worth it is a question each individual contributor has to answer for themselves. So, and so f this model is often really good for folks. So students, academics, folks who are already established in the industry, um, retirees, and folks that simply enjoy tinkering with technology, they're great candidates for getting involved in open source as volunteer contributors. So I'm told this is a Polish phrase originally. Um, so yeah, so not my, not my circus, not my monkeys. Wonderful way of disclaiming responsibility for resolving a problem. Uh, one of the key things to remember about volunteer contributors to open source projects, it's not their circus, other contributors are not their monkeys. Uh, it is not their problem to solve governance issues in a project. It is not their problem to address major architectural changes unless they want to. Um, yeah, all of the, all, all of the complex grief uh, that goes into this sort of thing, uh, not their problem. Uh, and so the only real obligation for open source uh, for individual contributors uh, is to respect codes of conduct uh, and respect the time of other contributors. Uh, like be open, be honest, be kind. Uh, when we don't, if we don't want to do that, we have the entire rest of the internet to play in. Um, uh, don't yeah, don't don't inflict our own issues on uh, on our fellow volunteers. Colleagues, though, is about changing the world as a job. 
finding new ways of uh, making our industry work. Uh, and so once folks accumulate responsibilities in the community, time commitment starts to grow, uh, and sustainability requires finding ways to get paid for that work. Uh, there, there's plenty of things in the open source world that need to be doing, uh, it's just not feasible to do them as a volunteer. Um, and so it's important to care about the sustainability of our peace community involvement uh, and support folks in managing their stress levels. Uh, and so colleagues in this sense may not actually be employees of the same company. Uh, they may work for trade associations, non-profit foundations, they may work for competing redistributors, they may work for companies that are already self-supported open source, um, they may work for consulting companies that rely on the project. All sorts of different uh, possibilities. But the key thing is that when you're getting paid to do something, you can afford to put more time into it, funnily enough. One of the other important things to remember, though, is that involvement in open source communities builds on three sort of interest, ability, time. And a lot of organizations are now starting to build hiring pipelines that rely on seeing open source contributions before they'll extend an employment offer. This is actually a serious problem because while it does let you gauge interest and ability before you hire somebody, the problem is that third pillar, the, the availability of free time. Because the availability of free time is heavily biased. Uh, and so hiring pipelines that work this way, that expect to see open source contributions before the offer is extended, they will inevitably reflect broader social biases in the relative amount of time that, uh, that is available to different groups. Uh, and so that's a serious problem. Uh, and so I want to highlight a couple of specific organizations that are doing important work in that area. Uh, so Outreachy, which is now a project of uh, the Software Conservancy, um, they offer paid scholarships uh, for folks from underrepresented groups uh, to spend time working on open source projects. Um, that's really important because building trust and building influence in the community takes a lot of time. Uh, and being able to get paid for that work through programs like Outreachy or Google Summer of Code extends that opportunity to people who may not have as much free time as those of us who already have stable, well-paying jobs, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the other group I'd like to help uh, highlight is Model View, Model View Pulse, which is a publication from, a, uh, from Model View Media. Um, this is one of the few tech press publications I actually respect, uh, because the vast majority of them, if you actually spend a lot of time reading them, uh, they're pretty much gossip magazines that star CEOs of tech companies. Um, which can be interesting to read, but it's not actually going to tell you a lot about what can be done to improve our industry. Um, whereas Model View Culture actually does its job properly in holding up a very, very critical mirror to our industry uh, and asking hard questions about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Um, and so it's a really important uh, publication uh, and well worth the subscription fee. Uh, and if you don't want to pay the subscription fee, they put most of their articles uh, online for free, and they're well worth reading. So, so yeah, so that's one for the folks who are getting paid to work on open source. Um, very useful publication to read and understand what they're saying. But to make money, the question is not what do you want to build. It's the question you need to be asked is whose problems are you planning to solve? Why should they trust you? Uh, and so the most obvious form of this uh, is open source software based consulting business models. Uh, another form, working for organizations that run self-supported open source software, working for commercial distributors. Um, and then a the third form we're starting to see more recently, particularly in the scientific software realm, uh, is applying for and receiving philanthropic grants. Uh, so Project Jupiter is a good example of work, one that works this way, uh, that a lot of their development is funded through, uh, through uh, non-profit grant programs. Uh, and so on the client side, the folks actually working on the open source projects generally aren't the people paying the money. Uh, they're the ones, but they are the ones funding work on the project because they have specific problems they want to solve, and applying open source is the right answer to them. 
Funding based on specific clients or benefactors works well at smaller scale though, but it doesn't really create the kind of recurring funding stream you need to commit hundreds or thousands of people working on open source full time. And so this is where the green section of that technology adoption curve comes in, uh, which is that you have users looking for solutions that solve their problems at a price they're willing to pay. And so this is where you can meet a common need uh, and get distributed funding for open source work. And so the key business development part task to figure out is to figure out what folks are ready, ready, willing, and able to pay for that you're prepared to invest time and money in delivering. So that's all very nice and hand wavy, but how well does it actually work? So there's two key aspects to consider. So the commercial relationships on the customer, um, on the client and customer side. Uh, how do you manage those? Uh, what's the main difference between open source and other software development models? Uh, and the key there is that you've, you've got an extra selling point of we're not trying to lock you in. Uh, if, if you ever get upset with us, you can go use, you can switch to a self-support model, you can go to a different vendor and get the same software, and so on and so forth. Beyond that though, you live and die the same way any other software company does on the quality of your engineering, your product management, your customer support, your documentation, training, partner ecosystem, strategic gameplay, so on and so forth. There's a lot of ways to fail um, on that side. Very few of them have anything to do with the fact that you're using an open source engineering model, uh, and everything to do with the fact that building and running a sustainable business is hard. Um, it's like there's a reason a lot of businesses fail. Um, that said, uh, there's a wonderful uh, thing which is that the best businesses are those that are built to solve a problem where building and running a business was the only way to solve it. Uh, and I think uh, in a lot of cases that can be a good way to approach sustainable open source. But at the same time, uh, on the community side, uh, with contributors and colleagues, it's a very, very, very good company uh, that will actually try and engage your community in the governance process. Uh, so a lot of companies that publish open source software, um, they're just using it as a competitive weapon. They're not actually trying to build a collaborative community uh, that helps them to build the software uh, and empowers their community to learn uh, and to uh, influence the direction of the project. So, Unfortunately, the open source industry is still young enough that we're very, very short on good scientific studies. Uh, so I'm unfortunately going to have to address the question with some personal examples. Uh, uh, and hopefully, at some point in the future, future versions of this talk will have a lot more case studies to draw from. So given where I work, this slide shouldn't be that surprising. Um, so yeah, so I work for Red Hat Developer Experience. Uh, this is a slide from Jim Whitehurst's keynote presentation at Red Hat Summit this year. Um, and so what it basically shows, in the center there, open source community is massive. There's over a million open source projects available on the internet. Um, Red Hat takes a kind of uh, a subset of them, creates community integration projects around them, uh, and then creates commercial products derived from those community projects. Um, and so the key here is that the customers consuming the paid products don't need to pay attention to the giant cloud of open source uh, because Red Hat's basically saying, hey look, we will tell you which ones are interesting. We will tell you which ones we think will save you more time than they cost you trying to figure them out. Um, and so what this, and, and so this is basically the model that's got Red Hat to the point of being the first $2 billion uh, open source company. In the, open, in the Python community specifically, uh, so we've been a C Python core developer for around a decade, um, and that slide shows some of the major community and commercial redistributors of C Python. Uh, and so not shown here, Python using organizations, Python consulting shops, folks using Python for in-house development and data analysis. Uh, so sustainably creating and giving away open source software is a pretty amazing goal. Um, and so a lot of people actually really do want to do that for a living. And they build companies to do it. Uh, they work for existing companies that are already pursuing it. Um, 
And so it does happen. It's like sustainable open source software does exist. Um, it's not as common as I'd like it to be, but that's one of the reasons why I give this kind of talk. Um, another really interesting one, uh, which earlier this year, uh, Roundcube ran a crowdfunding campaign for a thing they're calling Roundcube.next. Uh, so for folks who haven't heard of Roundcube, they make a popular webmail interface, uh, and they really like to see a strong open source competitor to alternatives like, uh, closed alternatives like Gmail. Um, and so with Colab Systems, they did a crowdfunded investment and major user experience update. The thing I found particularly interesting about this was they actually had a $10,000 tier uh, in their crowdfunding campaign. And they go, well, who's going to pay for a $10,000 um, tier in crowdfunding campaign? And what that was designed for them to do is to let them find commercial collaborators, uh, organizations that wanted to deploy in Roundcube or already had it deployed and had a specific interest in the next version. Um, and so what the crowdfunding campaign let them do is let them find their colleague community uh, and their client community uh, in addition to allowing potential contributors and customers to chip in at smaller levels. Uh, so this is, this is only closed still a few months ago, uh, so they're still just gearing up into the development process, but it's going to really be interesting to see how that plays out over the next year. But that's all very, very corporate very business oriented. That's the world I work in. So different folks have very different reasons for wanting to be involved in open source development. Um, so I can't obviously speak to anyone else's words. Uh, can I speak to my, my own reasons for wanting to work in an open source environment uh, and to help more folks succeed in doing so sustainably? So I've been an investor for longer than I've been a Python core developer. Uh, and so I tend to think of a lot of things in investment terms. And one of the key ones I think about is return on time invested. Like, based on time spent doing something, what am I getting out of it? Uh, and the default in our industry is that when you work for someone as a software developer, uh, as a designer, as a technical writer, the company owns everything you do. Uh, and if you leave, even though you wrote it, you no longer have access to it. Uh, you can't take the work that you did for the company and include it in a portfolio that you use to apply for future work, either in that company, well, for work outside that company. Um, and so even when some aspects of the software we work on is made and generally available, it's often only in a crippled form or in a firm where the provider can still exert complete and total control of the user experience. And so the thing is, working in that kind of default environment massively reduces the potential reach of your work because it's only going to go to paying customers if it's not available to the world at large. Uh, and it also ties access to my own future access to my work to continue to work for that particular employer. Um, and so, I mean, I did do this for a long time and it's kind of a bad deal. Uh, it's like, sometimes it's the right deal for us, but ultimately you do lose access to a lot. By contrast, when you pay to work on open source software, not only are you solving the problems you pay to work on for the customers that uh, for, the, uh, for the customers benefit, you're also making that available to anybody who can download the community project and get up running. Uh, and I'll always retain access to my own work, uh, even if I move between different employers. And so that's a much better deal for me, uh, since it means current future access to my work doesn't get tied up with the business interests and strategy of one particular company. Um, the other thing, too, is that open source simply is a better engineering model. Uh, so advancements in human knowledge improve markedly uh, when we start sharing information more broadly. Like, we are more. Uh, the open source model holds potential for the software development industry more broadly deserving of the title software engineering. Uh, and so we share links with peers saying, hey, this project might be relevant to you, uh, and so on and so forth. And then when we do we reinvent the wheels, we can still learn from past efforts. Um, we get increased negotiating leverage uh, in our careers, uh, and as working in the open, it offers greater opportunities for recognizing contributors. Um, and so when we ask ourselves, what am I most proud of? 
we can often point to it on the internet and say, hey, look, here is work I did that I'm genuinely proud of, uh, and folks can then appreciate, uh, we can then use that throughout our careers, we build out our portfolios. What all this means, though, is that open collaboration opportunities really matter at an individual level. Um, and the barriers to getting bootstrapped into that open development process are unfortunately incredibly high, as finding non-toxic communities to participate in can require a non-trivial amount of research. So, earlier in the talk, I already highlighted our HC model view culture uh, in relation to the work highlighting inequitable distribution of free time. Uh, two other groups that have done a lot in the Python community, uh, Pilot is an aid initiative. Um, They've done a lot to explain inadvertent barriers to entry, like ways we inadvertently exclude people from our communities uh, that results in measurable, uh, measurable differences between the demographics of open source communities and the demographics of society as a whole. Uh, and so much of what these groups have done is help highlight ways we can start addressing some of that. Unfortunately, not all exclusive behavior is inadvertent. Um, Sometimes there's deliberate and direct hostility designed to keep people out. Uh, and so a couple of groups uh, in relation to that, uh, Randy Harper's online abuse prevention initiative, um, and Zoe Quinn's crash over our network, designed to either reduce the incidence of that behavior put there in the first place or help people deal with the consequences of it. Uh, and so these are, these are things that help our industry build towards being worthy of that title of software and being sustainable. And so, again, I return to that first point. Your time is valuable. Uh, and so we want to look for clients and customers that respect our time and expertise and pay accordingly. But point the secrecy also wastes time and money for everyone involved. Um, however, default to closed is still rarely challenged, uh, even in otherwise innovative organizations. So organizations that demand we work in secret are limiting our potential reach, denying us future access to our own work, deliberately reducing our effectiveness as software developers, and deliberately restricting our future negotiating leverage with them and with other organizations. Now that said, sometimes it's still going to make sense for us to work on secret software. That may be the right thing for us to do, but I did it myself for over a decade. Um, but it's one of those things that one of the questions we need to ask as our industry, as we try to make open source software sustainable, uh, is what is secrecy costing us, and how we can use that to encourage organizations to invest properly in open source sustainable engineering, uh, and uh, help make ourselves and our peers able to keep doing what we love uh, for, well, as long as we can. Are there any questions to make? <coughs> Hi, thank you for this presentation. There's only one little detail I'm not sure I understand. If you could go back to this life cycle of product graph in there. There's one anomaly in there. So I assume the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is uh, adoption rate. And this, the chasm thing, it seems to me like suddenly we are losing all the users. There are no users for some time, at all. Um, okay, so what the chasm is, uh, represents is a lot of innovations actually end up not going anywhere. Uh, and because what actually happens is innovators get interested, they try them out, and then they go, you know what, this wasn't actually a good idea. They throw it away and go on to the next big thing. Um, and it's only a subset of, uh, um, only a subset of ideas that make it across the chasm into being interesting to a more, into a wide, interesting to a wide audience. Uh, and so that, that, the chasm is a marketing concept um, where it basically shows that a lot of ideas simply never make it across that. Uh, that doesn't actually mean that you have no users anymore, suddenly. 
Uh, no, so so it's it's a case of yeah, it, it's it's a bit of a um, artistic one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
have time for one more last question. So th this time it should not be tricky. Uh, so open source projects often have this difficult transition time where they stop being a single developer uh, or a single company supported project and become really open source project like really many people working on it. Do you have any tips or advice on how to get through this difficult period? Um, not direct tips. Uh, there are a bunch of good resources out there. Um, so there's uh, opensource.com has a bunch of stuff. Uh, there's uh, okay. So Floss Metrics um, has, a, has a few different things. Uh, but yeah, the key thing is to realize that there's people that have done this before and while, well as I said, there's unfortunately still too few examples of breakout successes, uh, there's definitely uh, lessons learned out there and the people running the community management side of these things uh, are just as open in their work as the folks doing the software development. So, so yeah, it's unfortunately, yeah, it's actually really hard. So, see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nick, for coming from Australia. So it's a long way. And thank you very much, everybody. And I invite you to, to go for a dinner.